Hello everybody, this is Peter Swidler with the highlights video of uh, Game 8 of the World Championship match going on in London between Magnus Carlsen and uh, uh, Fabiano Caruana. And uh, we were finally after a sequence of uh, non-eventful, uh, somewhat non-eventful games, although calling Game 6 non-eventful would probably be doing it a great injustice. But we were treated to a proper, uh, proper fist fight today, even though uh, opportunities have been missed, but I'm probably getting slightly ahead of myself. So let's start uh, discussing uh, what happened on the board. Uh, for the fourth time in a row, Fabiano opened with 1e4. Magnus also stuck to his guns, c5, knight of 3, knight c6. And now we finally uh, got uh, our answer to the question, what happens if uh, somebody calls Magnus' bluff and goes 3d4. Magnus, as expected, when takes, takes, knight of 6, knight c3, and d5. Uh, the choice is, as we expected, the Sveshnikov, and uh, Fabiano chose to uh, treat it in a very interesting manner. He uh, did play an idb5, of course, it is the only sensible move in the position, but after d6, he declined to even enter into all the uh, the uh, theory after bishop g5, a6, knight a3, b5, and just played knight d5 straight away. Uh, a line which uh, existed forever, but uh, w was never really considered to be particularly threatening. But uh, there are clearly some new ideas uh, in the line, and uh, Fabiano came very, very well prepared today. Black has to take e d5. Knight b8 is by far the main move. And in the in the olden days, people sort of automatically played c2, c4 in this position. But Fabi played a4, a move which uh, gained some traction recently, and there has been a number of very interesting recent games in this line. Bishop p7, bishop p2, castles, castles. Both sides are making uh, what appears to be uh, a sequence of uh, necessary development moves, uh, to which I think you include to that list the move knight d7, which uh, Magnus played here. And White's reply bishop d2 is very curious, because normally you uh, automatically develop this bishop to e3, now attacking the pawn on a7, black plays a6. The whole point of playing a4 and not c4 is to play knight a3 and hope to uh, get it over to c4. And then after a5 you get a very good grip on uh, on the situation on the queen side. And white does get uh, a decent amount of pressure uh, this way. But the bishop will also uh, potentially provide black with an important tempo. Uh, a5, a4 attacking this bishop will gain, bla will gain black a tempo arguably. Uh, when black decides to start developing his initiative on the king side. And bishop d2 is a way to prepare a4, a5, and also uh, to make sure that this counterplay with a5, a4 is sidestepped. Uh, the move recently has been played by a very promising uh, Russian youngster Grigory Aparin in two games against Boris Gilfand uh, in the Nutcracker tournament in Moscow in 2017. Um, Gelfan chose two rather um, circumspect ways of dealing with it. He played a6, knight a3, a5 once, and was actually completely winning in that game. He was first fine, and then Grigori uh, allowed some tactics and was completely lost, but then uh, Boris made a very big mistake and eventually even lost that game, uh, didn't even manage to make a draw. And he also tried after bishop d2 playing knight f6, and now Grigori played bishop e3, a6, knight a3, rook b8, and here a somewhat curious move b2, b4, uh, a5, and c3. Uh, this is not uh, how the structure on the queen side looks normally in this line, but white still retained some pressure, and the game was eventually drawn after Boris managed to uh, solve, all Black's prob solve all of Black's problems. But after bishop d2, the most natural move, I think, just ignoring what's happening on the queen side for now, is f7, f5, and this is what Magnus played. He also played it reasonably quickly, which, uh, once again, uh, the games between Aparin and Gelfand are uh, reasonably well publicized. They were played in a, in a well-known and important tournament, and I don't think Magnus was particularly surprised by bishop d2. After f5, uh, Fabiano played a5. And uh, in this position, black had the option of immediately playing knight f6, attacking the pawn on d5. And there was a recent very sharp game played between uh, another colleague of mine, uh, Nicholas Huschenbeth, who uh, um, works with Chess24 occasionally, recording very interesting videos. 
He played this position with white uh, against uh, Zbigniew Kraczyk, and the game continued bishop e3, and a very interesting move, bishop d7, inviting white to go knight takes f7, a7, sorry, and then black plays f4, bishop b6, queen e8, f3, and bishop d8. And black is combining some counterplay against uh, this uh, weird setup of white, white's pieces in the corner with just very direct play of, let's say, g5, g4, or maybe e5 and e4 in some position. And in the game, black also went for a typical uh, King's Indian slash Sicilian maneuver of knight h5, knight g3, because uh, you generally cannot take this knight on g3, because if the queen can land on h5 later, it just delivers mate along the h file. So this is a very sharp position. I thought initially it's completely incorrect to do this with black, and it's just a, like a punt in a practical game, but the machine doesn't even hate it that much. But after knight f6, of course, white can also choose to just play c2, c4, and after a6, return to c3, which is a normal square for this knight, and it can get to b6 via different squares, and this position probably is slightly better for white. But Magnus played uh, a5, a6, the knight obviously goes to a3, and here during the live show we were arguing for the move uh, knight f6, because we felt it probably prompts white to play c4, and then, of course, this, these two pieces don't really work particularly well together. But uh, instead of c4, white can play bishop b4. And here he has a very important tactical idea, which also exists in some Spanish positions, so I kind of immediately recognize it. It's a bit of a crossover. Uh, I thought black can play f4 here, once again spreading his wings on the king side, preparing to activate his worst piece on the board, the bishop on c8. But this runs into knight c4, bishop f5, and here a very typical shot. Knight takes e5, d, and d6. And white is actually much better, because he manages to break the position open and also wins uh, two bishops for... Uh, the, I mean, he will have two bishops against the bishop and knight. Instead of all this, after bishop b4, it is possible to play, let's say, bishop d7, knight c4, bishop b5. But this position, after knight b6, takes, takes, rook d8, and let's say f4 knight d7 and knight c4, the computer suggests white uh, has quite significant pressure here. It's not really uh, all that great for black at all. And Magnus played uh, his next two moves reasonably quickly, which really uh, led us to believe that he still knew what he was doing, he was still following uh, his analysis. He played e4, and after knight e4, c4, sorry, more or less instantly played knight e5, which is obviously a move you want to make, but you need to be sure you're not doing poorly in this weird structure. Because if white after c4 manages to neutralize the initiative on the king's side, he will just completely crush black uh, under the weight of these two passed pawns. But in this position, black can play the immediate f4, and actually it's probably dangerous for white. It's more, it's more problematic for white than it is for black, because uh, black has very clear play for, for, uh, connected with the f4, f3 breaks. For instance, after bishop c3, the machine just goes bishop c5. Bishop b5, queen g5 is quite obviously horrible, followed by f3. But even after b4 here, black just goes bishop d4, takes, takes, takes f3, and white already has to start giving this bishop up, because otherwise he gets mated on the king's side. Uh, which is why Fabiano instantly replied with knight b6. And also it was very, very notable that uh, Fabiano was playing very quickly and his first serious uh, time in the tank uh, came at around move 2021. So uh, a very, very good uh, bit of homework done by, by Team Corona for this game. And I think for the first time in the match, White was actually getting somewhere. Rook b8, f4 ef3, bishop takes f3, and in this position uh, Magnus made a move which uh, we couldn't really figure out. I was arguing for it myself until I realized it doesn't really contain a threat, and then it became obvious that black should have done something else. Uh, and uh, an interesting idea, I believe, suggested by Anish Giri, who will be joining the, the live commentary from game 9, which is something I'm very much looking forward to. He suggested that the move g7, g5 here, made by Magnus, and it really isn't a very good move, uh, was probably made because he remembered there was a line somewhere where the pawns did get to g5 and f4, and we couldn't remember exactly how, the, how that move order worked. And eventually, after some thought, and, and Magnus didn't play g5 quickly, not at all, 
he settled on this move order because it kind of solved the problem of when to play g5. You just play it immediately and then you go from there. But the move is not great and white actually has a very large advantage now. And uh, uh, the best move in the position is probably actually a 5f4. Uh, a move we were very seriously considering during the live show, but we did not like the idea of white taking on c8 here. Uh, and then playing bishop b4. But actually, we were sort of automatically taking with the rook on c8, when taking with the queen is much stronger, creating a lot of counterplay connective, for instance, with the queen c5 check ideas. And this position is just fine for, for, for black. The same applies to the position, I mean, bishop b4, allowing bishop g4 is just completely wrong. Uh, Anish on Twitter, I believe, suggested that the position Magnus meant was rook a4, g5. But actually, in this position, g5 is maybe not the most, uh, not the safest move black has. Bishop g5 probably is slightly stronger, although even after g5, uh, black seems to be doing sort of okay, although, I mean, he runs a lot of risks here, but... Uh, the machine uh, somehow holds uh, this position with, by playing rook c4 and entering into very uh, strange complications which seem to uh, work out for black. Instead of g5, uh, as I said, bishop g5 is a more, is a saner choice and sort of a more uh, quiet and calm choice. Although, uh, of course, white is not helpless here and after takes, takes and bishop c3, you can make an argument for this being uh, slightly better for, uh, for white. And uh, once again, the machine might even prefer g5 instead of bishop g5 here. But you really do need to remember uh, how to solve the problem of knight c8 and bishop b4. Well, and if Magnus perhaps didn't remember uh, what he is supposed to do here, it's very easy to understand how you would get worried about uh, never really equalizing here, because the bishop on e4 is a, is a monster and there's always ideas of queen h5. Uh, and also ideas of just continuing uh, to gain space on the queen side because black's counterplay is kind of stuck uh, without the light squared bishop and without really the option of playing g5, g4. And uh, one more move that requires an honorable mention is uh, after bishop f3, the move bishop f6, which I did mention on air as a kind of an in-between option which doesn't commit to anything yet with black and just... Uh, uh, asks a slightly awkward question from White of how to defend the pawn, uh, the pawn on b2. But here, uh, I think uh, this doesn't quite work because it also takes away from Black the option of playing a 5 f4. And the machine, somewhat surprisingly to me, actually says that White is better after c3, followed, for instance, after bishop d7 by bishop f3 e2. And even more surprisingly, after queen c7, uh, I gave the machine some time to think here, and it went king h1, rook b8, and then h2, h3. Not really a move I would have considered necessarily, but it finds it very, very important to stop counterplay connected with knight g4. And only after making all those prophylactical moves, it starts pushing with c4, b4, rook c1, and c5, which is, of course, the main plan uh, white has in this uh, very uh, interesting structure. Uh, and to return to uh, f5, f4, which is uh, uh, the best move, if white tries to get back to positions we've seen in the game by just simply just ignoring it and playing c4, black has a very decent option in bishop f6. But once again, uh, the machine shows uh, extremely um, surprising bits of subtlety here because it's very easy to decide that this position after takes, takes, queen takes, bishop b2, rook a d1, bishop b5, and queen e3 is quite bad for black. And it really is. This position is arguably maybe close to lost because of just how much better this knight is than this bishop on c8. But instead of bishop takes b2 in this position, the computer interpolates the check on d4 and then takes on b2. And the difference is, if white does the same and goes rook a d1 after bishop b5, queen e3, there is now queen f6. And you cannot take on e5, because by forcing the king into the center, black has created for himself this tactical option of queen takes f1, and he wins material and the game. Uh, and because of that, uh, this position is assessed as completely equal by uh, the all-seeing eye, whereas the same, the absolutely the same position with the king on g1 is very, very bad for black. 
which is not something you would expect. I mean, you can sort of see the common sense of including the check, but the, the difference of like a pawn and a half is not something I think that you would expect by just using common sense. Um, so that I think should cover uh, all the basics of why black, sh black should play f5, f4 here, which is something Magnus has not done. He played g5, to which Fabi immediately replied by playing c4. Black played f4. My initial idea and the reason why I was arguing for g5 during the live show was to play g4, bishop e2 and bishop g5, hoping to push f5, f4. But here, uh, the move g3, which we eventually realized was very strong because it stops that counterplay, is quite good. But somewhat surprisingly to me, the computer just plays king h1, waits for you to play f5, f4, goes c4, c5, and says, white is winning. Just completely winning, not even better, like um, plus two type advantage. And this absolute calm under fire is, is quite spectacular to watch in the computer lines in this, uh, in this variation. The computer is in a lot of spots just completely unafraid of all the counterplay black is uh, working so hard to generate on the king side. There are more variations like this uh, further down in the game. Uh, Magnus after c4 played f5, f4, which seems logical, but compared to the previous lines, basically, instead of playing bishop f6, which is a useful move, black played g7, g5, which is a weakening move, because there really will never be any attack on the king side for him. And Fabi replied by bishop c3, which is correct, and objectively black's position is more or less ruined, but it still remains, uh, the, the task uh, Fabi is faced with here to convert this into a full point is still very very far from trivial and uh, the impression I had during the live show that basically any move was winning uh, further down the road uh, I think is wrong and uh, there is really only one way uh, that white completely wins uh, in this game and it, it is very very difficult to find I believe I will I will show it to you in a moment uh, black played bishop f5, which we felt was the most logical choice, at least you've developed your worst piece and uh, you are trying to stabilize with bishop e7, f6. If you start with bishop f6, c5, dc5 and d6 is crushingly strong from, for 4 white. And if you try stopping uh, all the c5 breaks by playing queen c7, white can actually play b4, re-establishing the threat, and if you take on c4, Sadly for you, you are just completely lost after takes, takes on bishop g4, and the bishop lands on e6 with a decisive effect. Therefore, bishop f5. And here, Fabi spent, I believe, something like 35 minutes uh, on the next move. And I think he said in the, during the press conference, I, I, I've seen the quote on Twitter, that uh, the only move he was calculating in those 35 minutes was the move c4, c5, which is what he played and which is absolutely the correct approach. And people have been uh, sharply critical of that little bit of time management, saying that uh, anyone who's, uh, you know, ever done any thinking on the subject or read any of the Jacob Hoggard's books, for instance, for me, uh, this little bit of wisdom is uh, not associated with the name uh, of Jacob Hoggard. I remember Mark Dvoretsky, uh just randomly dropping this idea in a, in a lecture I listened to when I was a child. Uh, and that idea is the one bit of practical advice I always give when asked to, to uh, you know, provide some kind of a maybe lesser known idea that will actually make you a much better chess player. And that idea is if there is only one move you can make in a position, you should make it and then you should think on your opponent's time. But in this particular position, first of all, this is, it's not as if uh, white is in check and there is only one square the king can go to. There are obviously other moves. They are intuitively quite clearly worse than c5. I think any strong player will understand that c5 is the most critical choice here. But I was also making the, cho uh, the, the argument on air that the most likely reply to c5 here is black will take on f3, queen takes, and dc5. This is what Magnus has played, actually, and it took him about a minute to make those moves. In passing, we should mention that after g4, uh, white needs to figure out that bishop e2 is good. But once he does figure out bishop e2 is good, black is just completely busted. Uh, apart from bishop e2, none of the moves really convince. 
But once again, the piece is attacked, and if the strongest move is just uh, taking it out of the uh, out from the attacked square, it probably is within uh, a capability, the capability of a player of Fabiana's strength to to find that that idea. But uh, knight of three, queen of three, gc five was always going to be the main uh, reply. For Magnus was overwhelmingly likely uh, to play in the game, and I was making the argument whilst we were waiting. Uh, for Fabiano to make a move, that blitzing out c5, receiving knight takes f3, queen f3, gc5 in reply, and then uh, thinking for half an hour here, is arguably wrong, and you can you should probably not commit to c5 until you at least have figured out uh, which move to make here. Because if you play c5 and think here, you actually make it slightly easier for Magnus to deal with this uh, with the thing because he knows this is on the board he doesn't need to guess of course I think a hundred percent of the time uh, Magnus spent here waiting for uh, Fabi to make a move was spent on calculating c5 but still if you play c5 Magnus no longer has to guess and he can start calculating from here so I was making an argument for spending some time at least choosing a move in this position but maybe not as much time as Fabi did. But this is a tricky equation, uh, and I don't really know the correct answer. And with that all said, uh, we should probably move to discussing this position. And this is probably the critical position in the game, even though uh, objectively White was still close to winning, I think. I think it's fair to describe as close to winning, even after the move uh, that uh, he made in this position. During the live show, we were arguing for playing rook f e1 here. In general, I think it's very logical to occupy the e file because, in many cases, uh, you want to place the root, this rook on e6. For instance, after uh, rook f7 here, even the immediate rook e6 appears to be very, very strong. And another point of rook f e1 was that if black plays bishop f6, you are now quite happy that you played rook f e1 and not rook a e1 because you can play rook a d1 here, creating what seemed to us like a more or less unstoppable threat of d5, d6. But the ever-resourceful computer says that you can actually play bishop d4 check here, give up this pawn first, and then play queen d6. And if you play queen d6 here, you run into knight c4 followed by d6, and your position will get completely crushed. But if you do it in this order, check first, and only play queen d6 once the c5 pawn is gone. You do have the reply of queen c5 to knight c4, and this is very, very important, because you start counterattacking against the white pieces, making him spend time to protect them, and you also are prepared to finally play rook b8, for instance, and start fighting for the e-file. And in this position, for instance, the computer, if you give him time to think, starts suggesting that white should play queen a3, and this endgame is quite clearly better for white because the g-pawn is incredibly strong, but I would not uh, be prepared to commit to saying it's winning. Black could arguably hold this, although he probably will not enjoy uh, his life in the process. Uh, so after rook fe1, black actually isn't lost. We thought it was more or less winning in the game, but uh, with precise defense, black can at least make white sweat properly. And the move we liked actually less is rook a1, and that move is sort of mathematically winning in this position. But you need to see an incredibly beautiful geometric idea, which I think is very, very easy to miss. After bishop d6, uh, which is a move we did not like in this position, we kind of expected white to be winning here. White is in fact completely winning after both the immediate knight c4 and queen h5, uh, rook f7, and now knight c4, and the black position starts to collapse. There's just no way uh, black can coordinate enough to uh, hold this together. This is already uh, pretty much completely hopeless. But the move that worried us was bishop f6, and now you don't even have the setup with, of rooks on e1 and d1. And we couldn't really find any solution to this problem during uh, the live show. Uh, there are ways to play kind of sensibly here. For instance, you can play bishop e5, black takes, and plays, let's say, queen f6. And the machine says white st is still better, but the advantage has dwindled quite, quite significantly. But the machine also thinks for a bit here and says you can play h2, h4 in this position, and you are completely winning, more or less. And 
you can think of the move h4, but the fact is, if black just plays h6, uh, white is only winning because he has the option of playing g2, g4 here. And this, I think, is very, very easy to underestimate because it really isn't uh, a move you can make uh, lightly and it might not even occur to you. And the point is, if the bishop goes to h7, uh, then rook e6 comes in with tremendous force. And if the bishop goes in that direction, you can play queen d3, create the threat of queen g6 check, and after king g7, the d pawn starts to run, and black is just completely helpless here. And uh, all this is just uh, very, very bad for black. And uh, But I, I don't think you can blame anyone for not seeing uh, this h4, g4 idea. It just, it, it really isn't very natural. Um, which is why I think blaming Fabiano for not playing rook e1 and choosing rook d1 here is a bit harsh. Black is more or less obliged to play bishop d6, but I think the next move you can and should criticize. I think not playing uh, either knight c4 or queen h5 in this position is a mistake, although once again, uh, the machine says knight c4, g4, queen f2, and now either g3, queen d2, uh, queen h4, and h3, or f3, and in this position, even more remarkably, just rook f1, occupying the open file, and saying you have no attack, and I don't believe you will ever have any attack, and also creating the threat of knight takes d6 and bishop e5, and for, after rook c8, even more spectacularly, the machine goes g2 takes f3, with the intention of meeting, let's say, gf3 with king h1, and saying it will be me who is giving mate on the, uh, on the g file, not you. Uh, and this is apparently a very, very poor position for white. But once again, very, very few people, I think, can play like this in a practical game, just inviting black to move the pawn from g5 to g3. And uh, uh, just saying, I do not believe you will even give a, an important check in this game. But queen h5 is a much more uh, human decision, and it's very, very strong. If black plays bishop g6, you can play queen h3, re-establishing threats connected with the e6 square, and also kind of prompting black to play bishop f5, after which uh, queen h6 will be uh, much, much stronger once again, because uh, the bishop is much better on g6, uh, clearly, than it is on, uh, on uh, f5. And uh, if after queen h3 black goes rook f7, uh, knight c4 is just uh, very strong here, once again uh, creating threats against the bishop on d6. But mainly you don't even need to calculate very many variations in this, within this position because uh, white's play is simply based on the fact that this blockade will not last. The bishop on c3 is too strong, there are always ideas of lending uh, the rook on e6, and if the bishop goes, the d pawn starts to run, also knight e5 will become a huge threat. So here, I think you can use your positional understanding to just claim, I will be much better slash winning. And in fact, the computer says the best option black has, definitely in practical terms, is to play queen e8 straight away, queen g5, queen g6. And after queen takes g6, hg, knight c4, rook bd8, takes, takes, and let's say bishop e5, rook d7, and we can take with the bishop or with the rook, both are quite good. We end up with an endgame. Uh, which is very much similar to the one you will see later in the game, uh, but white is already uh, a pawn up. Whereas in the game, white actually had to start by winning a pawn back, uh, uh, which obviously is a very, very big swing in an, in an evaluation. I mean, this is close to winning for white, because the d-pawn is very strong, and also the bishop on e5, or when it goes back to c3, is just so much better than this bishop on f5. Whereas in the game, black, uh, black uh, held quite comfortably. And I think not playing queen h5 here, I, I think you do blame Fabi for not taking that decision. I think it is reasonable to say you should not have uh, wasted the option of playing queen h5. But then again, the move that he made, h2, h3, is only not very good because of one specific reply. But it is a very logical reply, and Magnus was not going to miss it. He plays queen e8 again. First of all, stopping queen h5 now, and secondly, bringing the queen over to g6, where it once again starts supporting the breaks with g4. 
And here black is suddenly completely fine because uh, he has enough counterplay and also the white attack in the center is just not fast enough anymore. White could try for a speculative sacrifice with, uh, sorry, knight c4 is what well, Fabi played, but he, he could play rook f1, queen g6, and rook e6. And during the live show, we, shot, we thought this completely doesn't work, but it's in fact still a draw. Takes, takes, queen takes, rook e1. And after both queen f5 and queen f7, white always has this shot knight d7. Queen takes d7, for instance, here, and uh, queen d5 check, rook f7, and white has this perpetual. But uh, there is no call for him to uh, to do that. Of course, he can play knight c4 instead. Magnus blitzed out queen g6, takes, takes, and h4. And once again, uh, the sequence that Magnus uh, showed here is uh, a sequence of best moves, uh, each and every one of them, but they aren't really uh, that difficult anymore. He took on h4, because otherwise his uh, structure actually collapses, so it's quite sensible to pick up some material along the way. Takes, takes, takes. And here, the move we were discussing on air, h4, h3, probably also draws, but I like Magnus' solution much better. He played h5, establishing a very good square for this bishop on g4, where it cannot be attacked, which is very important. Well, I mean, it, it can be attacked, but it will be a, an exchange sacrifice. Whereas on f5, it was kind of uh, hanging on air, and uh, white could play against it. And also, on g4, it obviously connects uh, with the g7 square, making it much, much harder for white to push his uh, very important passer toward the, towards the uh, uh, queening square. White played rook e1, bishop g4, rook f6. These are objectively uh, the only moves that actually uh, that give white uh, a semblance of, of hope. But uh, black really shouldn't lose this position, and Magnus uh, is not very well known for losing uh, reasonably equal uh, opposite color bishop endgames. He took, played king f7, bishop h4, rook e8, rook f1 check. King g7 really isn't a mistake here, but he played king g8, which leads to very similar positions. Rook f6, rook e2. And here Fabi played rook g6. We were discussing rook d6 during the live show because we assumed black wants to play rook d2, but actually simple bishop c8 is just perfectly good enough because there is really no progress white can make uh, in this setup. If the rook goes to d6, the bishop can return to g4 or wherever it wants, and the pawn is still hanging on b2. So Fabi played rook g6 check, black played king f8. Fabi played d6, uh, now creating the threat of rook takes g4 and d7 which Magnus obviously did not blunder by playing rook g2. And Fabi played rook g5 uh, and offered a draw because uh, once these two pawn pieces are traded, I mean pawns are traded, there's really nothing left on the board to play for. And uh, this concluded game eight, which I think was a very, very interesting, a very exciting game. And uh, Team Corona has done a very good job finding uh, a line which led to uh, sort of non-forced, very sharp, very unbalanced situations uh, with uh, uh, lots to play for. And uh, uh, once again, I have no confirmation that uh, Magnus's reaction of playing g5 and f4 in this position was just him mixing up some lines that he knew about. Uh, it feels likely, but I'm not sure if that actually is the case. But after he played g5, white objectively is... I think close to winning. I think it's not too much of an overstatement to say that this position uh, is, white is a large favorite to actually convert this into a full point. But uh, starting from uh, queen takes f3 and dc5, I believe, uh, uh, I mean, the next two moves are clearly not the best moves in the position, but not finding h4, h6, g4 in, in this position, I think is perfectly justifiable. But not playing uh, queen h5 here uh, is, this is something that I feel that uh, Fabiano will uh, be very unhappy about. And uh, with that, he let go of, uh, I think, arguably a much better chance to, to win a game that he had in game six, because that really was a machine line nobody really can be expected to find. But here, it was a not an open goal, but a very, very good chance to, to convert a large advantage into a full point. But it did not happen. And we go uh, 
uh, on a break before games 9 and 10 with the score still tied uh, all, all eight games were drawn and next game is on Wednesday Magnus will be white it will be interesting to see uh, what he decides to do because so far uh, black has been doing exceptionally well game 8 is probably the first game in which this is not true and Magnus in particular with white hasn't been able to uh, even sort of scratch the surface of Fabi's preparation. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you I hope you enjoyed the, this video. This has been uh, my uh, recap of uh, round eight of uh, the Carlson Corona match in London.